Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome, everyone, to MotorWeek podcast number 230. And joining me today on Zoom is writer, two-wheel and reporter, Brian Robinson. Hello, everyone. Over the Edge reporter, Greg Carlos. Uh, what day is it? Can anybody tell me, please? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And our Motor News reporter, Lauren Morrison. Hello. I mean, I, I, we actually are doing this uh, on the second week in May, uh, although days certainly are blurring. Okay, our rundown for today, we've uh, got, uh, we're going to talk, uh, and Lauren's going to chime in about the new plants opening up. Uh, around the country, whether it's too early or what, or who's doing it. Uh, there is a very uh, important anniversary for America anyway that has to do with fuel economy. The Toyota Prius has been here for 20 years. And we're going to talk about the future, and that's the 2021 Ford uh, Mustang Mach-E. There's some new developments there about uh, how it's going to stay current um, while it sits in your driveway. We've got a lightning round, a viewer question. We'll see if anybody's got a rant or rave. And that's about it. So let's really start at the top. Lauren, one of your um, motor news uh, features that um, we just put up, talking about a lot of the auto plants starting to open up. And of course, the big question is, is it too early? And what are they doing as far as safety measures? Uh, and, and after that, let's also talk about and get an update on new car sales. So why don't you start? Okay. Yeah, so um, a lot of these manufacturers have already opened up in China or in Europe. So they're saying that they're using a lot of the info that they got from that and they're applying it here in the U.S. So we're seeing a lot open up this week. And I think that they're doing all that they can. They're doing temperature checks when you come into the facility. If you are, in most cases, if you're above 100 degrees, your temperature is above 100 degrees, you're told to go home. Everybody has to wear face masks, face coverings. Um, and if your job requires you to be within six feet of somebody, there's additional PPE equipment, additional face shield, different additional masks. Um, in a lot of cases, they're staggering shifts. So if a plant was originally operating on a three shift system, they're starting back up on a two shift system. They're just giving more time for everybody to get out of the building so nobody's crossing paths, staggering lunchtime, staggering breaks. Um, and I mean, I, I, eventually we're going to have to start back. And I think what they're doing, everybody seems to have plans in place um, and taking baby steps, just seeing, just seeing what's happening. Um, so, I, I mean, we'll see what happens and see, see where we go from here and see if we get back up to full shifts and uh, full production. Yeah, that um, production, production, I think, is, is key because my understanding is there, many of the lines are only running at about half speed so that workers have a chance to do their their chore and get out of the way of somebody else. Brian, exactly. you were going to say? Uh, no, not me. I have no uh, knowledge to impart on uh, facilities <laughs> at the moment. You always do. Uh, do. Do you guys think that this is too quick? No, I mean, it's kind of going to be the new normal. We're going to, um, like Lauren said, all the protective gear and we're going to have to get out and get going slowly but surely and then if we have problems then we back it back down but it's kind of it's kind of what we have to do at this point you know uh, at the time we're actually recording this uh, podcast elon musk has basically oh, yeah. gone against uh, the authorities in california and has opened up the tesla plant anybody got an impression on whether he should have done that or is he just being elon or what I don't know. It's really fun to follow him on Twitter, though. He's like, I wake up in the morning and he's like the first guy I check to like see what kind of crazy <laughs> is going on overnight. He's like, it's my little joy of the day. <laughs> uh, Greg, if you were in that situation and you were a, a worker in California, how do you think you'd go in? Depends how much he's paying me. Uh, maybe <laughs> a lot of that has to do with compensation. Everybody's got a price. Seems like what the risk pay. is. Yeah, yeah I, I just... There's a lot of things that uh, he does that I feel like he just goes about the wrong way. Uh, I understand the frustration for sure. Uh, I know he wants to get the Model Y going, um, but yeah, there probably could have been a better way to do this than to just yeah defiantly open your plant. Well, California doesn't make it easy on you, even in normal times. Yeah, uh, much less in the middle of a pandemic. So 
That's the truth. Lauren, the, uh, looking at auto sales for the last full month, April, a lot of people were predicting that it was going to be down 80%, 90%. It was actually off about 50%. And at the end of the month, sales were coming back. What do we make about how the auto dealers in general were handling, you know, the peak month, I guess, of the pandemic in April? And what oh. are they doing in May? Yeah, so there was this study by KPMG. They went and talked to 2,500 consumers see, you know, in April to see what they were feeling and how showrooms and how buying was going to look after COVID-19. And I thought it was really interesting. I think um, a lot of people that they interviewed were people who were going to buy before COVID-19. And they asked them, are you still going to buy? And they said, yes. In fact, they were even more motivated to do so. And one of the interesting things I thought was, we talked about that, I think, in a couple podcasts ago, how we would, you know, we want to drive cars. We would never, you know, just buy a car without having uh, a test drive. And a lot of people are saying the same thing. Like, even after COVID-19, uh, they want all, it from start to finish, to all be e-commerce. They want the cars to be brought to their house for test drives. They don't want to step into a showroom. Um, I, well, I... I, I just don't see how that's practical. I, mean, I, I don't either because, you know, when I'm driving uh, or if I was going to buy a car and I was test driving, I like to get into one, get into the other, test drive this one, test drive that sure. one. We're going to have like a whole lot at your house, you know, test driving different vehicles. It just seems very impractical to me. Um, but I don't know. It's what people are saying that they want according to, yeah. this, according to the study. Uh, you know, it's people want one thing, but you know, you'd have to have so many dealer personnel to do that. But who knows? I mean, you know, there are some brands like Lincoln and, and some of the more high end brands, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. Yeah. Either anybody else have a comment on where we might go from here? <coughs> it's uh, I have a friend who's uh, actually trading in his Jeep to go up to an Audi, so good for him. Um, yeah. but <laughs> He actually did. <laughs> they actually did a, uh, you know, an assessment of his Grand Cherokee over Zoom. He just went out with his phone, and just kind of. Yeah. Uh, they asked him to take him to different parts of the car, and that's how they assessed it. That I mean, and he'll eventually have to go into the dealership, I think, still to sign some paperwork and all that jazz. Um, but you know, I gotta say, it's it sounds pretty seamless i'm sure it's harder on the dealers end mm -hmm. it's probably very hard to get used to but as a consumer you know I, I don't think it's that big of a deal i mean besides not being able to drive and you're, you're going to find a way to drive it if you really want to yeah well who knows but that does look like the future let's let's switch gears a little and talk a bit about the past and a little bit about the future um this is marking the, uh, this year marks the 20th anniversary for the Toyota Prius coming to America. And, you know, even though the Honda Insight was the, the, the first mass produced uh, hybrid uh, car, it was really the Prius and its terrific mileage that popularized hybrids. Uh, and they've sold 6 million of them worldwide. They've got a special edition uh, for 2020. And I guess the question I've got is, those of us that are in the business, the Prius is very significant. Do you agree that the public sees that? What do people think when they see a Prius? Should they be making such a big deal about it? And uh, would we be where we are with hybrids if it hadn't happened? Who wants to start? I'll jump in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they deserve whatever is coming to them as far as uh, accolades. <laughs> <laughs> Accolades for being the, they pretty much became like the Kleenex of hybrids. Like when you thought of hybrid, you thought of the Toyota Prius. And, uh, you know, they've added more hybrids throughout their lineup. And uh, I think more than any other manufacturer, they've really uh, increased the hybrid uh, knowledge in our country and certainly vehicles. So, uh, yeah, they, they absolutely deserve all the credit they get. And uh, I remember driving that original one around and then having yeah. to explain to people what a hybrid was. I mean, yeah. just within 20 years, you know, a lot has changed. Well, they did say a long time ago they were going, their aim was to have a hybrid of every vehicle they make, or at least sell here anyway. Greg, uh, I know hybrids don't necessarily light your fire, but 
What do you think about the Prius and its legacy? Uh, <clears throat> I was going to use a different analogy than Robinson. It doesn't shock me that he went to a totally analog Kleenex analogy. I was going to use the iPod where, you know, when MP3 players came out, nobody said, I'm going to go out and buy a Zoom, or they all said iPod, an MP3 player is an iPod. And that's exactly what happened to uh, Prius, as um, Robinson so elegantly described. Uh, but I remember when it came out, my dad, uh, as I've said before, is uh, drives a car hauler, and he was hauling Toyota. So I was very up to what was coming out through their pipeline. And it took so long to understand the concept of a hybrid, but it, granted, I was only 10, 9 or 10 years old. Oh. So, but uh, I, yeah, you know, I have a very vivid memory of reading all the, uh, those, uh, you know, actual physical books from the dealership that came out mm. on it. So, and it's, it's come a long way. I actually was looking up the uh, fuel economy. Um, the original was a 42 miles per gallon city and now we're up to like 54. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, may not sound like a lot over 20 years, but it's significant, uh, you know, I think. I, Lauren, do you I, remember when you first I do, Yeah, I'm, I'm with Greg. I, I remember, um, you know, I'm about his age too. So I remember them coming out, but I think it, it deserves all the kudos because like everybody's been saying, when you think hybrid, you think Prius. I mean, they kind of paved the way and it's crazy to think just in 20 years, how it, it paved the road for I think everything that's that's come forth now um you know it's it's crazy we don't you know really think about it until milestones like this come along mm. well congratulations to them but you know to, to just show what a broad-based car company Toyota is at the same time that they're celebrating the Prius's 20th it's been in the news for the last uh, month or so. We did a, uh, not only a podcast, but also a first look on it. The Supra at the other end, their sporty coupe end, has gotten a lot of updates for 2021. And I noticed just this week, kind of after we were, have already talked about it, there's a lot of hype going on for this new four-cylinder, the uh, Supra 2.0. And, um, you know, it's a whole lot less power. It's still BMW powertrain, I guess. Should we be excited that they're basically doing that? I mean, it seems to me, it, 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 is it going to take away from the luster of the, of the 3.0, which now has got more power? I mean, what do you think about a, a four-cylinder Supra? I'm not sure I'd use the word excited. I'm certainly intrigued by it. Um, less power, but also less weight, mm -hmm. uh, which matters, you know, if you just want a car to get on the track and do track days. Uh, so I'll hold off judgment until I actually get a chance to drive it, but I'm certainly intrigued. Yeah. Yes, they haven't released prices yet. That's going to be a, a key thing. Yeah, I agree with Robinson. It's um, the the one we drove last year was, and, and in, in Roebling this year, is already a tossable car. And now you take out like 200 pounds and you're losing horsepower. But that mm -hmm. doesn't really affect you when you're just throwing the car around in, in the corner. So that's, I'm really excited about that prospect. And it's not like a little amount of horsepower. It's 255 out of the four cylinder. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that's still fairly a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not bad for a four cylinder, Well, we'll see. And jumping again to an entirely different subject. And, and the reason I wanted to talk about this has to do with privacy that everybody's worried about. We've, I mean, for a car that's not been out yet, the uh, 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E uh, all electric crossovers got a lot of publicity and Ford's now talking about the fact that when the car gets updated, not only is it going to be done wirelessly, which is not that new, but it's going to happen in the background. So none of the systems on the car will have to be down like infotainment or performance or anything else. And I guess my question about it, do you worry if, if you owned one, would you worry about the security of the car, if they're able to do that much to it without you having any input, is there any kind of uh, invasion of privacy aspect? I mean, this is where the world is going. Uh, is it a good thing? I think it depends on who you are and what you value. Um, my parents would probably feel that it's a bit of a uh, privacy invasion. Or, I mean, when you're signing up for something, I don't see how you can consider it that. But, uh, you know, if you want the latest and greatest technology and you want it right away, you want it fast and you, you want Ford to 
take information from you and other buyers and make a better car, then I think it's awesome, you know, and I'm, I fall into that category. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. if they can update even performance. I mean, we're not even talking yeah. about just infotainment. They can actually yeah. add horsepower if they want to. We've seen it with Tesla where they can actually change the braking, the brake mapping through it. So, I mean, it, they can do a lot of stuff, which I think is really cool. Well, I'm doing this all, we're doing this on Zoom right now. So obviously I'm not too concerned about privacy. <laughs> but, uh, I think it's just a general rule with people are, are willing to give up some of that privacy for convenience. And uh, it's, we see it more and more every year. I mean, I, I agree with everybody. I mean, it, look in your house. You've got smart TVs. You've got these smart speakers. You've got Zoom. I, I think it's what, what you're willing to give up to get. And I don't know. I think it's really cool. I think it's an awesome, awesome option. But I mean, you, you know what you're getting into when you buy it. It's not like they're, they're hiding it from you. So you sign up for it. And just remember, everybody, change your default passwords on everything. <laughs> so that's, that's the best way you can think you can do to protect your privacy. Okay, let's move on to our lightning round. That was that was good. A little out of our, our bailiwick, but it's important. Um, while some manufacturers, this is actually coming from, um, uh, this is a lightning round, sorry. So we've got eh, 30 seconds, whatever, to talk about this. While some manufacturers have delayed the official unveilings of new models, as a matter of fact, some of them are saying we, there won't be any more in-person unveilings for the rest of this year. Others have adopted to virtual reveals at one of the spectrum, uh, spectrum. Hyundai did a live stream reveal of the new Elantra, while Lamborghini went even further and did an augmented reality launch of the rear wheel drive Huracan EVO Spider. What do you think about this? Is this going to be the norm from now on? It obviously can save automakers a heck of a lot of money from not schlepping everybody out to where they're going to do a reveal. And, but as car riders, uh, what do we feel about it? I'll start it. I mean, it's, it's, I think they've had to think on their feet. This happened quickly and they think they've done a great job, but I just can't see this being the norm forever. Nothing really beats getting in a car and giving an honest review. I mean, yeah, we can look at pictures and we can look at the specs that they give, but until you get in the driver's seat, you really don't know. I mean, I did the, the Huracan, the Lamborghini, their augmented reality. It's really cool. It's awesome. It's especially if you're you know, a fan just to look at, you can park it in your living room, in your driveway, just get a close up. But if I was really gonna buy a vehicle, there's no way I could get an honest review from just the manufacturer. So I, I just can't see this foreseeable for being the future forever. Yeah, I would, I would say certainly through the rest of this calendar year and then the next year, but they're gonna get back to real launches. I mean, one of the reasons they do that is because they can control the environment. They can bring everyone to uh, the particular place that they want and drive the car on roads that they select so to get the best review. So uh, as soon as they can get back to that, I imagine they will. Yeah, they can reach more people probably right away doing the live stream stuff. But uh, as Lauren said, you know, there's been so many cars that I, you know, I'll even see uh, release pictures or look at spec sheets before I see the car in person and I have an image in my head. And then I get yeah. there and the proportions look different. Like right. it's one thing to see it on paper or on your computer screen, but seeing it, it absolutely makes a difference. It's all about standing up and looking down at the vehicle, which they never take, almost never take photographs that way. So you're, and when you see it that way, you know, it looks different. It's even different than an auto show where they've got it up on a pedestal. So I agree with you hundred percent. And I think this is going to be a, uh, just until we uh, all get comfortable flying uh, in airplanes again, uh, with or without a mask. We do have a viewer question, uh, and this is from just about everybody on YouTube, and really the answer is pretty short. Will Motor Week continue the retro review marathons when full production resumes? The answer is we're not sure. Um, they have gone over, if you're not familiar, if you go to our YouTube, uh, uh, dot com slash motor week page every Thursday and Sunday we're running marathons of old shows um, we're, we've gone through uh, uh, season eight and into nine now and uh, they've they're very popular and thanks to Ben Davis uh, down in uh, Charleston uh, he's uh, the one the architect for them um, we'll see how things work out uh, we don't want to we basically want to keep some of them in reserve for later but we're delighted that uh, you've had a chance. 
I'm curious, any of you, you folks uh, had a chance to see any of them and anything surprised you besides changing hairstyles or lack of hair? I, I like your uh, seeing your delivery evolve, go up and down like this is how you started with your, uh, your yeah. voiceovers and then you kind of, <laughs> like maybe one year you go up here and then you go back down here. But <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's very, it's, it, when you're watching them in succession like that, it's very yeah. easy to pick up on stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, we get so many good comments about it and I totally understand why. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd love to keep that in our digital repertoire. Uh, but the reality is, is we'll eventually get back to normal production and it, it's time consuming. Unfortunately. Yeah, it <laughs> we is. Just, we just don't have the manpower. Yeah, I definitely check them out and I take notes so I can recycle a lot of those lines. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's great it's just to see the old school production values, you know, and everything's so fast paced now. I think there was, I don't know, you could probably, I'm sure a few would argue, but I think there was a little more art to it back then, uh, composing the shots and uh, instead of all just fast paced editing. That's neither here nor there. Yeah, I think maybe we should do an episode where, or just throughout the season, just dress up in the old motor week gear <laughs> when we're doing interior bodies and stuff. Oh, Lord. All the old jackets. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Enough of that. But to everyone that's asked, thank you very much. We're delighted that you've uh, enjoyed the marathons. And we'll, we'll see about keeping them up. But as, as everybody has said, it, uh, they do take a lot of effort. Uh, anybody got a rant and rave? Uh, Lauren, anything down there in Florida that uh, for the limited time you've been out of your house that has uh, irritated you? We hear a lot about people driving much faster than they used to because there's not as much traffic on the road. Yeah, I also, I was going to say one of these, uh, when we all get back on the roads, I wonder if we're all going to uh, keep up these fast, these fast speed limits. Everybody's <laughs> going to be like, oh, well, is the speed limit around this neighborhood again? Um, no, I don't know. You know, yeah, I barely leave my house. I don't even know what's happening out there. I'm on my bike a lot. There's a lot more, a lot more pedestrians. So yeah. if when you do drive, uh, I don't know. Either you two guys. No, nope, nothing <laughs> bothering you this Got week. Nothing. You're just at home, fat, dumb, and happy, right? <laughs> I'm actually having the opposite problem of uh, Lauren. I kind of want to get out and go fast. Like I'm sick of sitting and not. Oh, well, there you go. I would kill to take the new Supra to the track right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we've got a lot more coming on our podcast. We hope to be back in full production uh, very, very soon. Uh, we appreciate everybody uh, checking us out uh, on all of the platforms, our website, motorweek.org, at pbs.org slash motorweek. Of course, our YouTube channel. Uh, and to everyone out there, uh, we're still running uh, episodes on your public TV stations and on Motor Train Cable. Uh, they are repeats at the moment, but by the time you see this, hopefully we may be actually in the process of putting together our next new shows, which we will be running throughout the summer. So until then, I wanna thank uh, part of the team that we don't normally get to see or hear, our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood, back at Maryland Public Television and uh, also our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. Of course, Craig, uh, Greg here is our podcast producer. But to all of you out there, we appreciate very much that you've stuck with us through these uh, very terrible times and you've uh, made, made us all feel extremely valued. In a nutshell, we want to thank you for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.